And you can open your Bibles to Psalm 103. I don't know if you realize what a marvelous, marvelous psalm this is. Just a little uh, point of notice. I still hear people, they call, you see the whole book. Do you know what the word psalm means? Anybody know what the word psalm means? Huh? Song. Okay. So the whole book of Psalms is a book of songs. But each psalm is a single song. So it's not Psalms 103, it is Psalm 103. It's a little bit different than most of the other books in the Bible. Just when I was helping Daryl memorize, I I had to help him with that, that it was singular Psalm 103. Okay. Now, I have a regular pattern of scriptures that I meditate on. I remember hearing Kenneth Hagin talk about how that he regularly, consistently, and constantly meditated on healing and faith daily. I mean, there was hardly anybody that knew those scriptures better than him. But he did it regular, and I thought, well, man, if God has Kenneth Hagin doing that, I better do that. So I've done it all my life. Amen. And so, of course, one of those is Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. So that's, that's in my regular list of meditating scriptures. But I knew that there was more beyond that, and I have meditated some on that, but not nearly as much as I have in verses 2 and 3. But lately, the last few days, the Holy Spirit's been drawing me beyond verse 3. Notice what he says. He tells us, forget not all his benefits. On Sundays, we've been examining the far-reaching range of the two blood covenants to which we are joined. The old blood covenant and the new blood covenant by the blood of Jesus. When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you enter into a blood covenant. For the old blood covenant, this is a mighty impressive list of benefits Now remember, unless specifically done away with by Jesus and his redemptive work, the old blood covenant is still in force in our lives. Okay? And so God wants us to know all of his benefits. You know, now it's not as common today, but it is something that was more a thing of the past You know, when people were trying to decide which job they were going to do, they would not only consider the pay, but they would consider benefits, right? What kind of benefits is that? Now, we've seen now with the shortage of labor that, you know, people are getting these bonuses just to sign up to begin to um, work for a company. I know somebody started, oh yeah, um, Tim, um, what's his last name, the guy that usually sits, uh, Tim what? Ziegler, yes. His son, Alex, started at Woodcraft in Forreston. And I noticed that I, when I drove by there sometime recently, they said, to sign up, you get a $2,000 signing bonus. And so I said, well, did he get that bonus? No, he has to be there at least six months, which makes sense. You wouldn't want a person to, you know, sign up and then be gone, you know, get the $2,000 bonus and be gone the next week. That wouldn't do you much good. All right. So there are some benefits that they're starting to offer just because there's such a shortage of labor. Okay. But God wants us to know all of his benefits. 
so much of the church of Jesus Christ lives far below its benefits. Now, this is a true story, and I think I've told it before, but it, it just came back to me, and I, I, it's, it's such a marvelous story. It is an actual true story, all right? And it happened in England. A man came to work for a wealthy landowner in England. And when he started, he was in his 20s. The older, owner was in about his 40s. And um, he served this wealthy landowner for his whole life until the death of the owner. And uh, this man was now in his 60s, the, the one who served the owner. For, so he had been there over 40 years he had served him. After his death, um, a small cottage had been bequeathed to the faithful servant, plus a piece of paper with some fancy writing on it. The man had that piece of paper. He was just so impressed. It just looked so pretty. He had it framed and hung on the, the wall above the dining room table so he could look at it and just remind him of this wonderful, benevolent landowner that had been his master for so long. And, uh, and so the former employee did odd jobs for people around, barely eking out a living. One day a man came who was going to write a book about the wealthy owner since this wealthy owner was quite a famous person besides being wealthy and he had done quite a few uh, great things and the man knocked on the door of the former servant asking if he could interview him about his former master and the man said sure invited him in asked him if he'd like some tea and the author said sure and he was seated at the dining room table while well, the the former servant had went and made tea and the man looking around saw very spartan surroundings and the threadbare coat clothing of the former servant and had his eyes fall on the framed paper hanging above the dining room table and after reading a bit of it he excitedly reached up and took the framed paper off the wall and after reading a bit more of it the man excitedly asked the former servant if he had read the paper well, the man said, sadly said, well, he'd never learned to read and had hung that paper to remind him of his master, whom he missed greatly. And the, 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 the former master had, had uh, given him that paper just before he died. He said, now, don't, don't ever give this away. He didn't really tell him what it was, but just said, don't ever give this away. And after I die, this, this, this would be something that You'll remember me by, and he did so with a smile. And so the man, the, the author, said, so you don't know what this is? He, he breathlessly asked him, and no, the former servant said. The man went on to explain that this was the last will and testament of the wealthy owner that everyone had been searching for. The will said that since the wealthy owner had no children, no relatives he was close to, he was leaving his whole estate and all of his wealth to his former servant. Now here, the former servant had been barely getting by, almost to starvation point. His clothes were threadbare. He was just eking out a living, and here he had all this left to him. A lot of believers are like this man, not realizing the huge array of benefits meant for every believer. Well, of course, that former servant went on then to claim what belonged to him and didn't have to work for the rest of his living days. And so the name of my message tonight for you in the sound booth is Forget Not All His Benefits. So we're going to do a verse-by-verse -verse examination, at least of the, some of the benefits. I don't have enough time to get into all of them, because basically this whole chapter is an expose on the benefits that belong to us. 
and to the people of Israel in those days. All right? So let's look at verse 3 and see the first benefit. The first part of the verse says, who forgives all your iniquities. Now the word iniquities simply is a word that comes from inequities. How many of you know what inequity is? Equity means what? Well, it can. Okay, we talk about equity in property. That's, a, that's another meaning. But the word equity in its original form really meant uh, fairness of dealings. Okay? And it really is a blood covenant term. Inequity means you have been unfairly dealing with the blood covenant. You have broken the terms of the blood covenant. Inequity, iniquities. He forgives all of our iniquities. Of course, in the New Testament, that word's not used as much. What do they use in the New Testament? Unrighteousness or lawlessness or sin. Thank you. <laughs> Most of the time, it's just plain called straight sin. The word sin is the Greek word harmartia, which means what? I've said this before. It means to miss the mark. It's actually an archery term. To miss the mark. Okay? And so he forgives all of our iniquities or all of our sins or all of our unrighteousness. This one is listed first because without it, none of the others would do us much good. Why? Why? Because sin breaks our fellowship with God and opens the legal door for the devil to work us over. That's why the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard because you've just opened the door to the devil and he's going to beat the living snot out of you. Amen. When you transgress and see, now we think of sin like committing adultery or stealing something or whatever. But see, if you are filled with fear, you're transgressing the covenant. And you just opened the door and just said, devil, come on, beat on me. Just work me over. And he'll just use you as a punching bag. And pretty soon, I mean, it gets, it's, it gets real depressing really fast to be used as a punching bag. Anybody can say amen to that. <laughs> okay? And so... You need to put it under the blood of Jesus and uh, get forgiveness closes that door. And even though Satan may still attack us, he has no legal right to overcome us. We've been made more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors means we didn't actually do the conquering, but that conquering belongs to us. So that means we always win. See, I'll tell you, I love it. That's, that's one of the things that attracted me when I began to hear this, this message of victory and faith. We always win. I like to win. Anybody plays any games with me, you'll know I like to win. Now, I've gotten better about it. I just like playing now. Now, I don't have to always win, but man, I used to always have to win. And I wasn't always so nice if I didn't win. But God's just, you know, he's built that in me. There is a strong, and I mean, when you're dealing with the devil, you've got to have some of that. You've got to have some of that determination that you're going to win, you're going to overcome because it belongs to you, and you're going to put the devil underneath your feet. You're going to put that fear underneath your feet. You're going to put, you know, grief and sorrow underneath. You're going to put sickness and disease under your feet. You're going you're to put, you know, uh, poverty and lack, any kinds of attacks that he brings. Amen. And I'll tell you, it's no fun to lose somebody. It's no fun. Mary will tell you, I mean, you know, parents don't like burying their children. 
It's not any fun at all. But praise God, she's up in heaven. It's not God's best, but it was a good thing. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Amen. It's not God's best, but hey, we still win. But see, forgiveness puts us back in proper standing with God and the blood covenant. Look at Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Verse 28. For this, Jesus is talking about, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. See, he shed his blood to remit, cancel out. The blood of bulls and goats did what? Covered, atoned. But he, his blood remitted, means wiped it out as if it never before existed. Amen. Hallelujah. And then, of course, our famous one, one that you better know because you're going to use it a lot, is 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins. The word confess means to say the same thing as. When the, when the blood covenant says it's sin, then we say it's sin. If we say the same thing as God says about it as sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He cleanses us. Man, don't forget His benefit. He forgives all of our iniquity. You say, well, yeah, but it seems like I'm always stumbling. Well, then just use the blood a lot. After a while, you get tired of doing it and you quit stumbling. Amen. Number two, second benefit. Who heals all, how many? All our diseases. Doesn't matter. You know, people talk about, oh yeah, I'm dealing with the big C. Oh, you're dealing with Jesus Christ. I tell them. Oh, oh no, I was talking about cancer. No, to me, the big C is Christ. He's bigger than cancer. <laughs> He's the big C. He heals all our diseases. No exceptions. Avian flu, COVID, don't matter. He heals all our diseases. All of them. Don't forget it. Now it's a benefit we have to draw in from the spirit realm by faith, but it belongs to us. This Sickness and financial lack are two tools the devil uses the most to attack us. Why? Why does he hit us with sickness and financial lack more than anything else? Hmm? Oh yeah, okay, that's the reason, that, that's the result of it. But why does he hit us with these two more than almost anything else? Huh? Well, our healing. Okay, you're on the right track. What? I just said I think it like really affects us. How? You're right. Our senses. our senses. You're exactly right. Because when you are when you're dealing with sickness, man, it is in your body. Now, see, just you know, I have had over the years hardly any back trouble ever. And I got hit like Saturday night with something in my back. And that's very unusual for me. And I'm standing against it. I am the healed in Jesus' name. But see, I mean, it just, it, 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 it hinders your effectiveness. It hinders what you can do. Amen. Um, 3 John 2. Beloved, I desire above all things that you may prosper. And be in health, even as your soul prospers. See, notice the two things. He said, I desire. God says, I desire above all things that you prosper and be in health. Why? Because that's the two things the devil hits the most. Two, and you're right, Matt, and whoever else said, it, it hinders us the most. I think it was Brenda. It hinders us the most. I mean, look at Daryl. I mean, his effectiveness, he's still effective. 
He still witnesses to the nurses. He still witnesses to some people he runs into. He still prays for people. He prayed for a nurse at work there at Elam and the nurse got healed. I mean, glory to God, he's still doing stuff. But I mean, it's harder for him to go out and do his Gideon work. It's harder for him to hand out Bibles. It's harder for him to get where he needs to go. So it's hindering his effectiveness. I know um, Marlon Wolbert, who's part of the Gideon's group, said, well, we really need Daryl back full tilt because, I mean, he just did so much. And he's right. He did a lot. I just had uh, someone else talk to me and they just had a a dream of Daryl getting out of his wheelchair. (laughs) That's like the fifth or sixth person now that's had a dream about Daryl getting out or a vision of Daryl getting out of his wheelchair. I said, it's going to happen. I mean, it's a done deal. Just as much as when God said to Abraham, I've made you a father of many nations. It's a done deal. Glory to God. He is the healed man. Benefit number three, verse four, the first part of it. Go back to Psalm 103. Verse four. Who redeems your life from destruction. Mm. Man, every one of these are so good. Destruction is one of the three big tools Satan uses to come at us. Remember John 10, 10? The thief comes not but for... To, to steal, to kill, and destroy is a present tense form of the past tense, which is destruction. Right? I mean, right now Russia is causing a lot of destruction in Ukraine. Destruction is a result of him destroying apartment buildings and, you know, homes and so on and so forth. He's redeemed our life. He's bought us back from destructions. (sighs) Satan tries to bring destruction to relationships, to our finances and jobs, to our health, to our peace and well-being, to our circumstances, bringing destruction any and all. I mean, there's just so many ways that he comes to try to destroy. Psalm 107, just just turn over to Psalm 107, 20. And look at this verse. Psalm 107, 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. So Satan comes to bring destruction, but we've been redeemed from it. Destruction is the opposite of what word? Construction, right. Glory to God. Construction. Construction is when you're building something positive, right? Destruction is when you are tearing down what's been built. And he's the one who likes to tear down what... Good things have been built. Construction is a positive building up of something good, whether it's a building or, you know, well-being or whatever. It can be spiritual or physical. Destruction is the tearing down of something good. You know, it's interesting. I have several long-term friendships that I've cultivated and maintained over the years. Within the last three years, I thought the devil had gotten in there and really caused destruction of some of my very close friendships. And so I've been trying to contact some of these friends, and they haven't responded back. And I thought, Jesus, did I say something? Did I do something? I kept checking, trying to figure out what I might have done. And, uh, And so I wrote a pretty strong letter to my friend Eric who I grew up just about three quarters of a mile from when I was growing up in Boyd, Minnesota because I hadn't heard back from him. I hadn't heard back from him. Well, I didn't get a letter from him but I got a letter from his wife because he got married just a few years ago. And, uh, and she said, no, he's doing fine 
But he works at Swans and he's a manager and I think they're taking advantage of him. He's working 12 hour days and I think he's working like six or maybe seven days a week because they're so short on labor. And he's so wore out. She, she said he comes home, he hardly has time. He has a little bite to eat, looks at a couple of his emails and then goes to bed and then does it again the next day. And so he, he had even taken, never before had he not taken the time to get back to me. So it was a great relief to me. And then I'd been trying to get a hold of my friend Terry, who was a high school friend, one of my best high school friends. And we would get together on a regular basis to play board games. And, and so I hadn't heard anything back. And I thought, geez, what did I do with him? And I hadn't heard back for two, three years. And finally, the other day, I, I sent him a Christmas card and put a note in there. I said, man, where are you? you, don't, you I've been trying to get a hold of you. And he called up and he apologized. He said, I am just really terrible. I am a, the chief procrastinator. He said, I've been procrastinating, meaning to call you, and I just haven't done it, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, what I thought was destroyed, and I just was believing God for it not to be destroyed, was not really destroyed. He redeems our life from destruction. I am so glad that I still have those friendships because they're precious to me. Amen. God is so good. Amen. So he redeems our life. He has bought us back from destruction. Destruction through circumstances of many different kinds, he has bought us back from. Number four, the fourth one is also found in the second part of verse four, who crowns you with loving kindnesses and tender mercies. (laughs) Isn't that an interesting wording? He crowns you? Well, crowns refer to royalty. Coronation, the putting on of a crown was a big deal. It it refers to royalty. Well, what does Revelation 1 say? He's made us kings and priests unto our God. And so this is something, these things, loving kindness and tender mercies are things going to help us to rule and reign as kings in this life. The implication is that these benefits will help you to reign as a king on this earth. Loving kindness is the tender-hearted compassions God bestows upon us just because we're blood covenant partners and born again into his family. It's, it's the kind, the, those things, those extra things that God does. You're not believing for them. They just happen. How many of you know there's lots of those things that happen all the time, you didn't weren't believing for him. Amen. It's just like you know, God knows my love for birds, and I've told you that you know I'd always wanted to see. I never had seen an indigo bunting. I'd only seen a scarlet tanager in the woods from a distance, never seen it up close. And God, you know, I was standing at my kitchen window, and He said, "The Holy Spirit says, look up." And so I looked up, and there's a scarlet tanager. And then like, I don't know, about three weeks later, he said, look up again. There's an indigo bunny. It's just, that's, you know, people say, oh, that's just chance. No, that's not chance. That's God. I, I just thanked him. I said, God, that's so good. I've been wanting to do that. You know the desires of my heart. You know things that I like. And, and scarlet tanager is my favorite bird. But I always wanted to see an indigo bunny because I'd never seen one. I was talking with Deb Jensen. She said, oh, we have them at our house. I said, oh, shut up. I said it very nicely, but, you know, it's like, oh, come on. I didn't need to hear that. She said, oh, we also have scarlet tanager. I said, yeah, you're out in the middle of the woods. What do you expect? Glory to God. Anyway, to me, it was a big deal. It was just God blessing me. And, you know, if he wouldn't have said, look up, I wouldn't have seen it. And then this spring, we've had a barred owl, 44 inches tall, sitting outside. One time it was up on our um, television receiver, our dish receiver, and another time it was up in the woods. And then we had a hawk that was sitting there. And, of course, we have a lot of birds and and squirrels and stuff that come to the bird feeder. And so it it was just another blessing. It was just God, God says, I see you. It had blessed me. I'd never seen a barred owl before. I've seen a, you know, all different other kinds of barn owls and great horned owls and great gray owls. 
stuff like that, but I'd never seen one of those. See, that's just God just blessing us with things. How many of you parents? How many of your parents? Okay. How many of you just like to bestow blessings on your kids and grandkids just because? Not because it's their birthday. Not because it's, you know, we're, we're always getting something special for Silas and Miles. It's like they come into our house, okay, okay, what do you got for us? <laughs> you know, but I want them to be that way. I want them to know that, that coming to grandma and grandpa's is special. I want them to begin to see God in us, that God's good, and he just bestows blessings. Amen. And so, you know, it's just, it's just so neat. And see, now, you guys seeing birds, if you're not a bird lover or bird watcher, that means nothing to you. But see, God knows what your special thing is. I mean, Rhonda could be out shopping, and she finds this, this perfect outfit. I mean, it is just the perfect outfit, and it's on sale, and I mean... She gets it for almost nothing. And she comes home and shows Jeff, Ooh, see this? Look at I got it for almost nothing. Jeff goes, that's great, honey. But I mean, he doesn't get it. But see, God knows your heart. God knows what's special to you. And he blesses you. Loving kindnesses, tender mercy. Now, tender mercies are God. Remember, mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. And there's times... <laughs> When we're maybe not walking, we're so good and, and God's mercy overshadows where we're not walking so good and still the blessings come through. That's God's tender mercies because of what Jesus did. He crowns our life with loving kindnesses, tender mercies. Mm. God's so good. So I thank him for all the little things. As well as the big things. You know, I've often said this, but, you know, it was Andy Iderly that taught me to be thankful for the little things. You know, I, I, I was overlooking things. And, and he'd come in and he'd, he'd be all excited. And I thought, man, something big must have happened. And it would be some little thing. And I'm going, you know, he's right. He saw God where I wasn't seeing God. And I changed my perspective. And I see, because look at James 1. Hold your place here. Go to James 1, verse 17. Every good act of giving and every perfect thing given is from above. Every good act of giving, every perfect thing given. I've said it before. I thank God for green lights. I thank God for just, you know, God and I have a, a kind of a special thing where, I mean, every so often God will let me find money. You know, even if it's just a penny, sometimes it's a dime, sometimes it's a quarter, sometimes it's been a $5 bill. But, it, it, you know, even if it's just a penny, it's just like God says, I see you. Amen. I see you. And it's just, it's just kind of a special thing. Now, maybe God's got something else he does with you, but that's what he does with me. So I'm finding money all the time. And God says, I see you. You're special to me. And I go, thank you, Father. Hmm. And see, there's blessings that are easily noticed and blessings not so easily noticed. If you have eyes to see, start looking for all the little blessings as well as the big ones. And be thankful. Okay, let's go back to Psalm 103, go to verse 5 now. The first part. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. Mm. This is both physically and spiritually. Are you thankful for good food? Are you thankful you have food? You know, in the United States we can get kind of take for granted that we have food but some places they don't have food or very little satisfies our mouth with good things look at Psalm 34 
Hold your place here and go to Psalm 34. Verse 8. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, it's just, it's, it's just so marvelous. Go over to Psalm 119, verse 103. It's so marvelous. You know, there's a good taste in the things of God when it's the Word of God rightly divided. It's, it's just good taste. Notice here, Psalm 119, verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey... To my mouth. Mm. Glory to God. Jesus tasted death. That was not so sweet. Hebrews 2 9. Hold your place in Psalm 103 and turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. He tasted the bitter taste of death. First spiritual death because God laid upon him the sin of the whole world, then physical death. And then he tasted the second death went to hell for us. Took our place, became our substitute. He tasted all three forms of death. Why? So we can taste the taste of life. The life of the ages, eternal life. Amen. And all that goes with it. When the latter rain hits in its fullness... Remember that I said, you will taste the goodness of God like never before. Some of you still look at me when I talk about things like this, and some of you just like, okay, pastor, if you say so, remember that I said it. Because it's going to leave a taste in your mouth unlike anything else. Mmm. Amen. Go back to Psalm 103. Verse 5, the sixth benefit we're going to look at. Verse 5, second part. So that, notice these are connected, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Oh, it's interesting that all of a sudden this verse in the last few years has become much more important to me. I don't know why, but for some reason it's been a, a constant daily confession. Amen. I believe the world's programmed to get old, sick, and useless through the words that they say. Well, you know, I'm getting old and can't do what I used to do. This seems like I'm getting sick all the time. Tired all the time. Can't do the things I used to do. That's not Bob and Doris's confession. Glory to God. <laughs> and I just, they are my heroes because they do not let age stop them. And we don't, any of us, have to let age stop. I quit making confessions. When people start going, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like the other day I was looking at something with Scott Monserud. And, Mon and Scott looked at me and said, well, Pastor, you're, you're, you're getting up there now. I said, I'm not up there yet. Watch, I can still do the things I've always done. I can, well, most everything. 
when I was younger, I used to, you know, the, the, the hay rack behind the baler, you know, we were baling square bales, and it would be moving, and I'd run and jump up on there. I don't do that anymore. I might be able to. I, I just, I'm not going to try it anymore. Okay? And, you know, I used to hop up, jump up on the back of my pickup. Now I climb up. Not because I couldn't, but just, just better. Glory to God. But, you know, I can still lift pretty much the same amount that I've always lifted. Don't buy into what doctors and so-called experts and others say you can or can't do because you're getting older. Make this verse your confession. And combine it with Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let Christ be your strength. Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his mind. Ephesians 3.16, that he strengthens you with might by his spirit in the inward man. Glory to God. I don't do as much as I used to because I choose not to, not because I can't. Amen. My youth is renewed like the eagles. Glory to God. Number seven. This is found in verse six. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. You should be excited because that's exactly what we in the United States of America are right now. We are oppressed. Here in the state of Minnesota, living under emergency powers way beyond it should have been happening. Having to wear masks that don't work. Social distancing that doesn't work. All these precautions because it's an experiment to see if we'd comply. The Lord executes righteousness and justice unto all who are oppressed. This is a verse all of us can stand in for the things happening in the U.S. right now. Don't be moved by what you see and hear. Be careful who you hear it from and how you interpret what you see. Righteousness and justice belong to us. My constant confession is that righteousness is reigning in the United States of America. Righteousness is reigning in the state of Minnesota. Righteousness is reigning here at Eternity Church. And for 45 miles around, I said 35. And they corrected me and said, Pastor, you've got to include us. We're out there about 45. Joe and Ashley corrected me. So I said, okay, I can do that. I got 10 more mile faith. Amen. Glory to God. So be careful. Most all of mainstream media is baloney. It's fake news. It's exactly what President, President Trump's the first one who had enough guts to call it what it was. Fake news. And it's just, you know... Uh, Epic Times newspaper, Newsmax, there's a few other, RAV now, I can't remember what that stands for, but you know, that's a pretty good outfit. I know Kenneth Copeland's got good stuff. You know, there's a few that are out there, and there's getting to be more that are putting out real things. Even, you know, Fox News used to be so conservative, and now they've kind of gone the other way. Except for Tucker Carlson and I think one Sean Hannity, about the only two that have stayed straight. All right? So he executes righteousness and justice to all who are oppressed. And finally, in the last one we're going to look at tonight, verse 7, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. So how is that a benefit? It is our choice... We can either be like Moses and get to know God's ways, or we can be like the children of Israel and just be spectators and get to see his acts. And we're moving into a time, folks. You gotta you gotta choose. See, you're 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 on the cutting edge right now. You're gonna be involved, you're gonna know his ways. I am teaching you the ways of God so you can operate in the fullness of the power of God. 
You're all going to be carriers. The glory of God, you come here, get filled up with the glory of God, and you're going to take it out. But there's other people who are going to come in, and they're not going to know the ways of God, and so all they're going to do is just be able to watch God's acts, which is a, going to be mighty spectacular. But they're not going to get to be participators like so many of you. I want to get to know his ways and fully participate and cooperate with him. Amen. And so these are benefits. He says, don't forget any of his benefits. There's a lot more. I don't have time to get into them tonight. Glory to God. So many benefits to following God. So many benefits for doing it God's way. And you know what? If you falter some and you stumble some, just put it under the blood of Jesus. God's not going to condemn you. God just reaches out and put... That's why, you know, people come back and and they think they're kind of a little bit cautious because they think, you know, pastor's going to get on my case. You know, there's mercy and grace. You know that you stumbled. I know that you stumbled. Who cares? You know, it's between you and God. We're just here to welcome you, love you, accept you, throw our arms around you. Say, glad you're here. Amen? Glory to God. Let's go ahead and receive our offering tonight. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for being so good. All these benefits. Thank you, Lord. No matter what kind of shortages, no matter what kind of things the world says about our financial situation. Thank you, Lord, there's no shortages in you. There's no lack in you. And we thank you, Lord, for those who tithe and give offerings. Father, the windows of heaven are open unto us, and we're not in any way going to accept any kind of lack. And so we thank you now, Father, in Jesus' name, for directing each one of us to bring our tithes, that tenth of all our increase, and offerings as you direct. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody agree to that said? Amen. If you're making out a check tonight, you make it out to Eternity Church or Market EC. If you're giving cash, you want a tax-deductible receipt, raise your hand. One of us should give you an envelope. Just keep your hand up until they get to you. Glory to God. Remind you about Saturday night prayer. It's still going on. Important. And uh, then uh, we're going to wait again about maybe two or three minutes. And we'll go into Wednesday night prayer here. And uh, glory to God. And I was wondering, because I have an FMT meeting, Bob, if you could lead Wednesday night prayer for me. Would you be willing to do that? Oh, it has? I hadn't heard that. Uh, Pam's out in the entryway. It has not. Okay. So FMT, so, or is Marine coming down to, to lead? Okay. Okay. Either, either, um, Either uh, if Maureen is able to do it, if not, if Bob, if you would be willing to lead, uh, that would be great. All right, let's all stand then, present our tithes and offerings to him. Say it out loud, say, Heavenly Father, I bring my tithes, I give my offerings according to your word, according to the covenant. And you said, as I give, it will be given unto me. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together, running over. More than enough is coming to me. Overflow is coming to me. Abundance, superabundance is coming to me. The blessings of God are coming upon me and chasing me down. In Jesus' name. Amen.